379 passengers and crew on board uh, an Airbus A350. Um, they are out of that aircraft. There are some injuries, but it is really quite a miracle uh, in terms of what we are seeing. Joining us now, Andreas Spath, with an international aviation journalist, Vinamra Longani and Captain Amit Singh. Uh, Andreas, let me come to you first. The fact that 379 passengers and crew were able to get out of that aircraft seems to indicate a remarkable evacuation process. Would you agree? Yes, absolutely. And one thing that if you watch the videos today or the footage, you can see, for example, that the Japanese passengers are all very disciplined. Nobody takes any hand luggage down the escape slides, which we have seen other crashes previously, which is always very dangerously hampering evacuation. And also the Japanese crews are highly trained. So, of course, in this case, it was adding up that both the passengers and the crew, as is tradition in Japan, were very disciplined. And another important factor, of course, is that this is a brand new aircraft model, the A350, which has the very highest standards in fire uh, resistance of the cabin interior materials. And that really showed today as well, as it took actually a pretty long time, uh, over 15 minutes, I think, until the whole fuselage was engulfed into flames, meaning there was ample time for everybody to evacuate. Captain Amit Singh, this has been a huge concern here in India and elsewhere in the world. When an evacuation order is given, passengers often panic. They try and get hold of their hand luggage uh, and it takes time. The entire process of evacuation becomes a mess. But over here, presumably, in just a couple of minutes, they had 379 people, passengers and crew out of the aircraft. Not all of the emergency uh, slides were, were operational because there were fire on certain sides. So even with a reduced number of emergency evacuation slides, people were out. That's, it just really says something about how this can be done effectively. So the key word is training, 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 training of the cabin crew, pilots, not just them, the Fire services, the ATC controllers who have to keep the entire show going on despite an accident happening at the airport. So the certification standards of any aircraft dictate that they have to demonstrate entire evacuation of the aircraft within 90 seconds with half the emergency exits available. This was the typical scenario and the most adverse scenario in which you have no Just lost that signal with him, but uh, uh, Vinamra, you tracked this very closely. Your thoughts about that evacuation process? Well, thank you for having me on your show again, Vishnu. Uh, I mean, at the outset, it's heartbreaking to see what's happened. Uh, you know, aircraft are meant to fly people from A to B, and to see an aircraft just burn in front of you is unfortunate. And coming to the evacuation, you see, like Amit was saying, you know, cabin crews are trained on this year after year. And, and this is part and parcel of, you know, what they are essentially hired for. You know, a lot of people just honestly forget that cabin crew are on board an aircraft primarily for their safety, for the safety of the aircraft, for the safety of the passengers and, 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 and for their safety, really. So this just reiterates one exceptional st uh, training standards at Japan Airlines, uh, like uh, Andrea said, of course, you know, this is a clear reflection on, you know, Airbus and the aircraft per se, because, uh, you know, and while it's unfortunate that the aircraft was burning, but it also gave ample time for people to just get out of the aircraft and sort of, you know, uh, evacuate. So, so yes, uh, kudos to the OEM and, you know, and, and cabin crew per se and their training. And, and I personally seeing this, I'm just glad that, you know, people were able to evacuate the aircraft and no one was hurt. You know, Captain Singh, you were speaking about uh, the training standards. That's uh, absolutely imperative. But the conduct of passengers is also critical in a, in a situation like this. 379 passengers and crew on an A350-900 in a high-density configuration. Um, it, I mean, getting so many people out, a lot would depend on how the passengers went about it, right? That's uh, basically the culture of the uh, country, uh, the disciplined approach that every passenger follows. And uh, the key word is panic. So if you are aware of the systems of the aircraft, you trust your airline and you trust the training of the crew, you will be assured that uh, there is no need to panic and you will go in an orderly fashion, which will be faster 
rather than panicking and picking up your bags, which is obstructing or slowing down the whole evacuation process. If you see the engines were running at some point of time, the overwing exits could not be used, which means four exits are out. The aircraft was inclined nose down, which means the rear were not optimal. So only two effective exits were used and the whole aircraft was empty. That is uh, the effectiveness of the crew and uh, the uh, discipline of the passengers which made it happen. Uh, Andreas, uh, what do we know so far about what caused this accident? As far as I know, basically the cause was that this uh, aircraft, the <clears throat> Dash 8, operated by the uh, by the sea, um, sorry, by the Coast Guard, by the Japanese Coast Guard, they were supposed to fly from Haneda to the earthquake-affected area and deliver goods to there. And apparently this aircraft, which is a bit of an older type, and of, of course also is not an airline-operated aircraft, they didn't use this very common system called ADSB that actually transmits the exact position of an aircraft either in the air or to the ground uh, to the air traffic controllers and to other pilots, of course. So apparently neither the controllers nor the gel pilots approaching were aware of the fact that this uh, Dash 8 aircraft of the Coast Guard had incurred on the runway. So this aircraft was on the runway and apparently nobody was aware of that, probably as a mistake by the crew of the aircraft, of the National uh, Coast Guard aircraft. But this aircraft apparently was obstructing and kind of occupying the runway unknown to anybody else. So that's why this crash occurred. And that, from what I know today, of course, not the final verdict yet, but this seems to be the scenario that we know so well about so far. Captain Amit Singh, you know, your thoughts about uh, the, the moment this actually happened, visibility was all right. Would it at all have been possible for the pilots of the Japan Airlines aircraft to actually see uh, a runway incursion at the point of impact or close to the point of impact? The whole accident is uh, pointing towards human factors, both from the point of view of the twin otter, which uh, was not supposed to be on the runway, and the pilots. There were two pilots on the A350. So uh, the approach was at night. At night, uh, the typical phenomena is illusions, hallucinations. Uh, you keep seeing so many lights. There's a sea of lights. Uh, you have runway lights, centerline lights, approach lights, taxiway lights. So in between, if you have certain lights, small lights flickering or glowing steady, so you will not notice it, not likely to notice it because you will, do not expect an aircraft on the runway when you're about to land. So that is unexpected event, a uh, black swan event that uh, this aircraft was there at that particular time when the 350 was uh, just about touching down or rolling down the runway after landing. So uh, the pilot's attention is towards the landing and flare point. They're not scanning for uh, these objects to be there. So the attention of a pilot is typically saturated uh, at the point of approach when the stress level is highest. So an unexpected uh, aircraft or an object is typically not noticed by the brain. So this is the human factor angle of it. Uh, we typically had this uh, a near accident wherein a 320 landed over four aircrafts in San Francisco. A couple of years back, they lined up on the taxiway where four aircrafts were lined up. The two pilots could not see the four aircrafts because they were so engrossed in trying to focus on the landing spot. So that is what uh, uh, the brain is capable of doing, obscuring certain things, uh, which we call uh, uh, the human factor or the invisible gorilla in uh, aviation or psychology parlance, uh, that the obvious will not be noticed. So that could have uh, uh, occurred, that is called inattentional blindness. So the brain is capable of playing tricks and illusions, especially at night uh, when there are so many uh, lights to confuse the pilots. So uh, this is uh, uh, one important area which needs to be focused uh, besides the technical aspects of uh, why the incursion happened, yeah. were the guard lights or not. No, no, absolutely. So, uh, uh, Andreas, yeah. let me just come to you next. Uh, Haneda Airport, one of the busiest in the world, I, as I understand it, the busiest in Japan. Uh, the airport was shut down as well for a period of time. So uh, this has had a ripple effect, uh, uh, you know, I mean, on aviation in Japan, one of the heaviest, most dense uh, sort of aviation sectors anywhere in the world. Indeed, and I've been only myself to this very uh, observation terrace in Haneda a few weeks ago when I was visiting Tokyo and I also visited Japan Airlines, which actually, in fact, has a very amazing and uh, uh, amazing and, and, and futuristic uh, idea. They have a special safety 
promotion center after their accident in 1985, which was their last accident ever, in the, where the 520 people were killed north of Tokyo because of a faulty repair in a 747, they established this amazingly high-quality safety culture that we saw at work today, and that's actually culminating in a so-called safety center where you can visit still today the artifacts of the wreckage from this accident in 85. And answering your question in general, yes, indeed, and it was uh, amazing to see as well in terms of Japanese efficiency that the Haneda Airport, Japanese busiest, in fact, with 90 million passengers every year and huge New Year's traffic right now today, that was only closed briefly. So uh, fairly soon after the accident and, and a few uh, and a few diversions to Narita and other airports around Japan, they reopened, they partially reopened Haneda. So from my understanding, it was only a fairly short total shutdown of Haneda, which of course mitigated the effect a little bit of this big and important airport not being able to serve any flights incoming. Uh, Vinamra, typically in a situation like this, when an order to evacuate is given, what exactly is the procedure for, uh, uh, for personnel on board, flight personnel on board, the cabin crew? How exactly does it work? Well, Vishnu, um, there, there, there are very... drills. Vinamra, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so there are drills uh, that, you know, uh, that that th there are premeditated drills, drills or like drills in this case when there is uh, there is an emergency which they have to face. And and they've been time and time again, you know, every year when you do your recurrent as crew, you know, you're taken through this in a rig. You know, there are there are there are situations similar to this. I'm sure this particular situation will now become a, a sort of a training aid going forward for ca for cabin crew and airlines across the world. Uh, and, and they're trained to evacuate an aircraft. But what, what I would also like to bring to the fore here is while full credit must be given to, you know, the crew in this case and probably uh, as widely sort of like, you know, applauded the Japanese passengers for, for listening to the crew and, you know, for, for a seamless evacuation, cabin crew are actually trained to deal with all sorts of passengers. So God forbid if, if something like this was to happen tomorrow in another part of the world where passengers are not sort of, you know, uh, of the same, uh, you know, temperament, for lack of a better word, or who, are, who, who don't take, take instruction very well, the cabin crew are well within their right to sort of, you know, expedite uh, the evacuation by, for instance, if someone walks with a bag to the door, you know, you can literally take the bag off them, their handbag and throw it in a corner. And just, just with, with, in the small of their back, you can, you can, you can sort of pat them and force them down the runway. So, uh, pardon me, but uh, the, the evacuation slide so much so that even if there is a bit uh, even if there's a couple of people at the bottom of the slide who are not moving away, you do not stop the evacuation. You keep ensuring people keep going out because the idea is to get as many people out of a burning aircraft. You know, if, if they if they break a bone or two at the bottom of the slide, at least they would not burn and die. So so crew are trained for all sorts of situations. And if this was to happen in another part of the world where passengers aren't as cooperative, one would hope. Uh, what, what, I mean, as per training standards, they, they would still be able to achieve a similar result. Yeah, one would hope so, but it really depends uh, on, on, on the reaction of passengers. Getting out hand luggage and trying to push through uh, to an emergency exit is a recipe for disaster. Uh, Andreas, uh, you know, the fact that uh, uh, there's extensive use of composites on this particular airframe, you referred to it briefly when we started speaking, and the fact that uh, it took a long time to actually burn essentially meant that the structural integrity of the aircraft was maintained for more than enough time for people to get out. You know, the pictures we're seeing now are well after uh, people evacuated, right? But for the initial couple of minutes, the structural integrity of this aircraft was absolutely okay. It was really unprecedented also in the way that we all could watch this whole thing unfold in real time on a live stream from Haneda. I was sitting here spellbound at my screen and was looking like for 40 minutes. And that's really unprecedented to see an A350 burning down to the ground in 40 minutes and you watch it live on the other end of the world. Uh, that's quite remarkable in itself. And on the other hand, I was quite amazed and impressed um, by this very first time ever that one of these new composite aircraft entirely burnt in aviation history, as I obviously could see how the structure of the aircraft 
was uh, with, withstanding the flames much longer than I was used to seeing from uh, aluminum aircraft. But what I found most remarkable really was how long it took until we saw any major fire having spread to the cabin. Because initially, for approximately 10 minutes after the aircraft came to a standstill, we just saw fire underneath the main carriage. And then there was only a small fire in the cabin, and one fire truck was almost dousing it and extinguishing it. And then all of a sudden, it kind of finally, it uh, was able to kind of uh, take over the biggest part of the cabin. And then still, it took like half an hour before the real inferno was on. And if we have ever watched maybe on YouTube some historical footage of other aircraft fires in previous history, you very often see that the entire aircraft, as we see it here right now, is consumed like this after maybe five minutes. And that was like really a slow motion here, which is very good news, of course, for aviation safety, because it gives passengers a lot more time to evacuate. Uh, Captain Amit Singh, uh, you know, one of the key aspects perhaps we should look at is um, in the case of a fire, it's the, uh, it's the fumes which actually uh, often result in fatalities first, even before the fire. Um, not only uh, was, was there no fire on board, uh, the fumes, as we understand it, in the initial period were also kept at a minimal. So the atmosphere within this densely packed metal tube was satisfactory enough for people to get out. Uh, that's a key factor, right? Yeah, that's the most important because uh, smoke kills the fastest. Uh, before fire kills you, smoke will kill you. And in these modern aircraft, like the Airbus 350, the, uh, the plastics which are used, they produce less uh, of that toxic substance. Uh, the cloth which is used or the carpets, they are fire retardant. And it will take about 15 minutes or longer for that uh, level of uh, gases uh, to be produced that could affect. By the time the passengers would have evacuated uh, the composites of the aircraft, the aircraft is made of composite material. Again, uh, the standard is aluminium, but uh, the certification standards require that the composites which are used should have equivalent level of safety as aluminium. And today we have witnessed uh, that certification standard being demonstrated uh, in uh, real time. Uh, the wings, if you see, the wings have protected uh, the fuel tanks. The fuel tanks haven't burst. So there was no explosion of that sort because, uh, as I said, a nose wheel collapse followed by a fire is the most adverse uh, situation in an evacuation. And this was an unplanned evacuation. Normally, there could be a planned evacuation wherein everybody knows and they are prepared. This was an unplanned. So there was a big startle effect. There could be a time delay. Uh, so the system, whole system protected. The purpose of uh, the rescue fire services is not to protect the aircraft or douse the flames primarily, but to save lives. So they typically concentrate on the areas which are more likely uh, to be uh, used by passengers for evacuation and uh, douse those areas, cool them down so that passenger evacuation is expedited. Uh, studies have revealed that the midsection is the most, uh, because that is where the fuel and the engines are. So that is the area which is slowest in terms of evacuation. Uh, and we saw that uh, those were not used uh, since the engines were running and fire was there. So the typical portion of the area which is safe is the rear portion, wherein you get about uh, 90 or more seconds for evacuation. But in this scenario, it was too high to be used. Yep. Uh, we had the only option of the front one. So No, but uh, you know, there were people the who came out of, of, that, aircraft... of that near vertical rear slide as well. Uh, yep. We've actually got some of that footage. That is the is, slowest area in this. Uh, that was that was quite this, remarkable, the, the uh, you know, Amit. The fact yep. that people did use that slide as well, and it was almost vertical. In fact, that's the, that's the footage coming out of the rear of the aircraft. Yep. Yeah. No, no, absolutely so remarkable. You have to typically climb yeah. climb on an incline and then get down on the steepest drop. So uh, you need to have that uh, kind of uh, the process and the discipline. That whatever the cabin crew says, you have to do it. No, no, absolutely. It's so just remarkable that it, that it went down this way. Look, I'd like to thank... Which is the most dense. Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, all of you very much for joining us. I'm out of time on this, but uh, let's just spare... Uh, let's just remember or spare a thought for the families of those who lost their lives on that uh, Japan Coast Guard aircraft. Five of the six on board dead. 
but 379 people on that Japan Airlines Airbus have had what is truly a miraculous escape. This story. A miraculous escape for 379 passengers and crew on board a Japan Airlines aircraft that caught fire as it landed at the Tokyo Haneda Airport. Reports suggest that the Japan Airlines Airbus collided with a Coast Guard aircraft on the runway. The latter was delivering earthquake aid. The circumstances around the incident are not clear yet, but the cabin crew of the Japan Airlines plane have received praise for the quick evacuation. The Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's office said he wants officials to quickly assess the extent of the damage. While the plane was on fire for more than two hours after the incident, it is a near miracle that all on board survived. With Vishal Vivek, Bureau Report, NDTV.